بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد question says هل يجوز دفن الميت وفي سن أو فيه سن أو سن ذهب with regards to burying a Muslim who has a gold tooth is it permissible to bury the Muslim without removing the tooth can the tooth go into the ground with him or does the gold tooth have to be removed? Does the gold tooth have to be removed? Many Muslims have gold teeth. Especially a lot of Muslims who come from areas of the Caribbean. Well-known practice of gold teeth. Whether it be Jamaica or Guyana or wherever. Let alone Muslims that come from America or from overseas. But it's well-known in the Caribbean. Many people, they have gold teeth. So, what's the rule on getting a gold tooth first and foremost? Is it even permissible for a Muslim to have a gold tooth? Whereas we know the gold is haram for men and it's permissible for women. And if it is a necessity and if it is permissible to have a gold tooth, does the tooth have to be removed, i.e. the gold tooth is considered wealth. It's wealth, it's mal. And when a Muslim dies, all of his wealth is supposed to be left behind for his needs. Preparing his body, washing, shrouding, burying, his will, his inheritance, and obviously his debts. Obviously his what? His debts. He may owe someone money. And that gold tooth may be more than enough to pay off the debts that he has. Or he may have two gold teeth or three gold teeth. That may be more than enough to pay off the debts that he has left behind. And obviously if he doesn't pay off those debts, then it's going to be a serious issue in his grave. A serious problem with his afterlife. So with all of these things being taken into consideration... You know that the brother has a gold tooth, it's solid gold, it's worth something. Does the tooth have to be removed or is one allowed to bury the Muslim and all of that wealth go to waste? That's the question. The answer says, Al-Jawab, In amkana fayambaghi naz'uhu, faitha lam yumkin naz'uhu illa bil miqla'i yani bi mu'alajatin wa qal'ihi fala yambaghi. Fahadha muthlatun lin mayyit. بل يدفن هو وسنه هذا إذا كان لا يمكن أخذ سنه الذهبي إلا بمقلع كأن يكون لبس به والسن ثابت تريد أن تقلع السن بما عليه من الذهب هذا لا يجوز لك وأما أو أما إذا كان يؤخذ باليد يعني لم يكن ثابتا فهذا ينبغي أن يؤخذ هذا معنى ما قرره أهل العلم في هذه المسألة question says if the tooth can be removed Without difficulty. It doesn't have to be yanked and pulled from his mouth with pliers or any type of device or tool. He says, then that's one thing. As far as if the tooth is firmly planted in his gums, in his mouth, then it's impermissible to be removed. And that's because it is mutilating the dead body. It's mutilating the dead Muslim. It's mutilating his body. So therefore he is to be buried along with the gold tooth or the gold teeth. Along with the gold tooth and the gold, or gold teeth. However, teeth he has in his mouth of gold. As far as if it can be removed without this type of difficulty, then it should be removed because it's from his wealth. It's a value. And there are people who are behind him who will benefit from that value, no matter how small or how large it may be. So this is a summary of what the ulama of Islam have mentioned, if the mufti here says, regarding this issue. Next question says, بعد دفن الميت هل من السنة قراءة سورة الفاتحة عليه جماعة after the deceased is buried is it permissible is it from the sunnah for everyone to get together and to recite سورة الفاتحة for all of the Muslims to stand over him and to recite سورة الفاتحة in congregation is this something from the way of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم the answer says هذا من البدع ليس هذا سنة لو كان خيرا لسبقون إليه سيد الخلق وافضله محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم دائما يخرج مع أصحابه الذين أو الذي هكذا مع أصحابه الذي يتوفون في حياته وما نقل أنه يقرأ عليهم الفاتحة نأتي بشيء جديد من عندنا ما جاء به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا فعله سادات صحابته رضي الله عنهم بل ندعو له ونقتصر على ما جاء عن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو أنه إذا دفن الميت نقف عند قبره قليلا ونقول له 
اللهم اغفر له اللهم ارحمه اللهم لقنه حجته اللهم ثبته وما أشبه ذلك كما فعل حينما وقف على قبر عثمان بن مذعون رضي الله عنه The answer says this is an innovative practice this is made up this is a bid'ah this is an innovation and this is not from the sunnah and if it was any good to do this for our deceased brother we're mourning, we miss him, we love him, he was our family member if it was any good in it for him or for us or for both then obviously the Prophet and his companions they would have beat us to it the Prophet and the Sahaba they would have beaten us to it because they were smarter they were closer to the pure Islam they loved Allah more than us no doubt Allah loved them more than he loves us there's no way mathematically that we could have beat them to something that's so obvious and simple now pay attention now this fatwa, this principle, is pertaining to one issue, but it pertains to any issue in the deen of Al-Islam. It's a golden principle. A golden principle from which many, many Muslims misunderstand and misuse and abuse. Making dua after salah, doing this, saying this, the Prophet's birthday, any issue. People, they'll argue, it's not haram, you can do it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just khair, it's good. Don't be so harsh, don't be so strict, you're a wahhabi. So, a million things they may say to you. And they may be right. Maybe it's okay to celebrate the Prophet's birthday or to make dua in congregation after the testimony. Maybe. But if it was, do you say it's good in it? Of course you're going to say Tavan. Of course it's good. So how could we have done something that Abu Bakr didn't do? Or Umar didn't do? Or the Prophet himself? How did he forget something or leave off something or neglect something and we in 2019 just came up with it? Of religion. Not the worldly. Not the worldly affairs. Worldly innovation is a different story. That makes any sense. That makes what? That makes no sense. So if there was someone at your funeral, and this is the wife of the deceased man, his sons, his children, they're being patient, right? They may be crying, but they're being patient upon the calamity of death. And then there's someone who comes and says, I knew your father and I met him once. And he's crying and shrieking and falling out and passing out, so on and so forth. How would you look at that person? The people who are the closest to him, who live with him, was with him day and night, they're not even in a situation in which a person who barely met him is in. You wouldn't look at him with sincerity. These are the people that are closest to him, and this is one who barely met him. How can you have more love, affection, and care for him? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't what? Doesn't make sense. So if the companions didn't do it, how could it be good? And if it was good, how do we outdo them? doesn't make any sense. How can I have a closer relationship, a better relationship, and more detailed knowledge of your father than you and your brothers? It doesn't make any sense. So this is the concept of anything which the Prophet did not do specifically, whether it is a bid'ah or not, whether there's some general proof for it or not, whether some mufti or some scholar says it's okay or not. If it was good, they would have what? They would have beaten us to it, not just done it. They would have done it what? First. It's common sense and is applicable to any aspect of what? Of life. The closest to something or someone is obviously supposed to be the what? Firstest to that. And it's not like someone who's the example of a relative. You may not like your father or you may not like your husband. You, you weren't that close with him. Many sons, many daughters, many people, they really don't like their family members that much. That's one thing. But we're talking about someone that was with the Prophet Sallallahu day and night. The companion who spent his money, who was wounded, who was injured, who left his family, who divorced his wife, etc. All for the sake of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There lies no doubt the love that they had for him. And they saw the Quran being revealed with their eyes. Everyone understand this? So it's impossible for you to do something in which they forgot to do. He says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never did this. And he would always go out with the companions and bury the people who died. Those who died jihad, fi sabilillah. Those who died of old age, whatever they died for, the Prophet, he went to many, many janazas. He went to many janazas. Nor did the companions do it. And how many battles were there in the time of the Sahaba? How many martyrs were there? How many people died? But they never, ever did it. So the Prophet, والسلام, he instructed us to do simple, basic things. After the one is buried, we stand and we make dua for him and we say, Oh Allah, forgive him. Oh Allah, have mercy on him. O Allah, allow him to answer the questions properly. O Allah, give him firmness. Things like this, as the Messenger of Allah والسلام, did at the grave of the companion Uthman ibn Madhun. Not ibn Affan, Uthman ibn Madhun. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa This is an extremely important Islamic principle to understand. 
of what is to be done and what shouldn't be done concerning janazah or concerning any other issue in al-Islam. Allah knows best. The Mufti is Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Humaid. Rahimahullah ta'ala.